<coughs> okay, hi everyone. We can make a start now. Um, I'm Don. Uh, I work on the F Sharp language design and the compiler. We have here also Vlad and we have Will, who also are part of the core team who work on the F Sharp compiler. And, and of course, we have everyone else who's joined from the community, which is absolutely fan fantastic to be part of. And we have here Samuel Berger. Nice to have you along, Samuel. Jack, uh, is that Jack Fox? I think I heard you earlier on. Welcome along, Ryan and Josh Mitchell and Peter and Eugene, uh, Eugene who works for <coughs> um, JetBrains, works on the F-Sharp support in JetBrains Rider. Uh, we have Sergi Tion <coughs> from Minsk, who is, does the F-Sharp Weekly. And we have PRS, PRS BK. Uh, sorry, I don't know, haven't met you before. Lovely to have you along for the first time. I don't know how to pronounce your name, but uh, I hope that's okay. Uh, and feel free to chime in and say hi. Uh, we're, we're just sort of getting set up and get, getting started. And Antonio, who just joined, lovely to have you along. Um, right. Well, let me turn my video off and I will now share my screen. <clears throat> Okay. And today's session is on, is on uh, F sharp compiler internals. And we, this is sort of set up as a chat between uh, Vlad and myself, but anyone can dive in and ask questions at any time. I'm hoping that Vlad will monitor the, uh, the chat session in uh, the Teams call. So you're welcome to uh, just Pop in with uh, by voice. Raise your hand. Uh, Vlad will stop me if I if I'm going on too long, and we can uh, answer some questions. Vlad might also have some questions for me along the way, and Will might also as well. I've been having regular one on ones with both uh, Vlad and Will recently, and we've been going through a range of technical topics. Uh, and uh, yeah, they. are if you're working on anything to do with the compiler, they are wonderful people just to get on a call with and uh, talk through th things. Um, Will's been doing some fa fascinating work on sort of doing kind of model implementation of uh, various parts of the of a of a sort of cut down version of F Sharp, a little mini perfect programming language uh, that and and sort of making a model .NET compiler for that. He might be hopefully sharing some of that work publicly soon. He's shared some of it with me, but it's really fascinating because it distills out the techniques that can be used at each level of the compiler. And uh, let's just take a look at, um, let's take a look here. All right, uh, let's go to the F Sharp compiler guide. Uh, the compiler technical overview, which has been moved to a different location. Is here. And uh, okay, we've been looking at this each time. This is the first place you should start to go and understand the structure of the compiler. Uh, <clears throat> it probably assumes you know a bit about compilation and parsing and other aspects. And this is the overall structure of the compiler that we've been using week on week. And in previous talks, which you can go and look at a previous sort of conversations, you can go and look at us talking about the optimizer. Uh, we can also look at which other parts did we do? Remind me again, Vlad. Um, we we went through the uh, just you know basic stuff uh, like the. We did the overall structure. The overall structure of the component. overall structure. We like you, you fixed a bug online. People loved it. <laughs> uh, we went through the okay. optimizer. Uh, we covered the. Uh, reasonable state machines, which you know, like uh, yes, involved to that's the, right. that's the that's the other one. The, the builders in yes. general, 
um, which sort of happens in this kind of co-generation kind of phase at the end of the compiler. But we're popping up to the top of the compiler this week, up to the parsing and lexing kind of level. And as I said to Vlad when we were arranging this call, this is not my favorite part of the compiler. It's, um, I don't really know why. So I, mean, I guess I guess the basic fact is that F Sharp uses uh, a, a thing, a tool called FS Lex and FS Yak or Lex Yak for, for tokenization here and for parsing. And it will probably always use those tools. It uses a modified version of those tools. <coughs> and <coughs> that's, it works just fine for the language spec that we have, but people don't tend to use that technique for lexing and parsing anymore. And I think that's one reason why this isn't my favorite part of the compiler. It's not, a, it, but honestly, we can't change it now. The tools it uses is the tools it uses, and I think it's always going to use that. Uh, and those tools are very good in some ways. They're declarative and they're and they're pretty fast for a declarative parsing tool. Uh, but they also, they're just old fashioned. People don't do parsing like that anymore. They tend to write handwritten uh, recursive descent parsers. <coughs> and some glitches in the F sharp language or the F sharp error recovery and other things may be due to us using those tools. So let me just take you through the basics of the source code. So let's open up the F Sharp compiler service solution here. I tend to start this from the command line like this, just by running devenv. That's just how I work. Uh, I will, I'm going to make sure yeah, everything is sort of closed. And where are we? I should have. This stuff beforehand. Here we are. Let's close these files down. Close these windows. I should have got this all set up before. No windows, close windows, fine. Oh, look at that, All right. And okay, so let's take a look at where we are in the, the lexing and parsing. Let's go right out to the very top of the compiler and we can find that. Okay. Uh, we can find that in the, the driver, fsc.fs. This is not actually the entry point to the compiler. There is another uh, driver around the driver, which is actually not in this project because I've only got the F Sharp compiler service solution project. This is, as I've mentioned in previous talks, this is the fastest way of getting working with the compiler is this particular project at the moment rather than, than the full solution file. Uh, and uh, we also have in FSC, we have uh, main.fs. This is the actual entry point to the compiler. And it sets up some things like the GC mode that we're using, etc. And then it calls driver.main, which is here. And this is old, uh, some old code, which basically just calls main compile in here. And we can't, because it's not part of the solution, we can't get to that, but that is this function here. And this just calls type check and compile, uh, which is up here. And it runs through the various phases of the compilation. And the very first one is main not main one. So let's take a look at those. And this is main naught, and it has a whole lot of things, but somewhere down here, once it's decided on a whole, all its various options that it's, it has, it actually starts to parse. Let me take a look at where that, 
Well, let's, let's take a look where the source files source files flow to. And it is pars one input file, which is here. And this is the uh, entry to the parser. And it sets up a buffer for lexing the uh, contents. Uh, so it sets up the uh, a reader for the file. And it, it then views this stream as a lex buffer. So the lex buffer is one of the core data structures underlying the, 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 the process of parsing, the lexing and, and then parsing. And the lex, what is a lex buffer? Well, let's just take a look. A lex buff, if, if this is right. Uh, it, um, it is, it's the right way to look at this. Uh, okay, let's go down a bit further into pars one lex buffer here. Pars one input from the, le the lex buffer. And the lex, uh, then we set the lex buffer up for parsing, and then we have various flags that we can use. And this is actually a good, uh, a good place to start because we can see we, you can see the actual kind of the structure of the parsing here. First, we have a lex buffer coming in, and the lex buffer effectively will give you give you tokens on demand. You just ask it for a new, new token, and it, it it is a state machine. It's got some state inside it. You uh, ask it for a token, it'll give you the next token and maybe adjust its state a little bit along the way. And in fact, lexa.token is the way that you get a, uh, a function to pull tokens out of the lex buffer. Uh, and the lex buffer is in charge of um, reading a chunk of input from the file and then kind of working through that input, giving off tokens off that input. Uh, one by one, and then when it hits the end of that buffer, it'll go and fill up the buffer with more reading from the file. And here's the token function here, uh, which you give it some arguments, and then every time you give it the lex buffer, it'll give you up a token. And then the, the final token is a special one called end of file token. And we can see that here, because if you get the F-sharp compiler out, here and you go tokenize, you'll get a nice message saying, hey, that's only for testing, but it's in the production compiler, so you can use it in your, in just don't use it for part of your product, okay? Because <laughs> we might take this out. We mean it when we say this command is for testing only, okay? And it means testing the compiler, not for testing your own source code. So if you, that means you can tokenize things, and you can see what the tokenizer does here. Uh, in that we have the, the, the this thing here gives up the stream of tokens, and then we put another thing on top of it called the lex filter, and the lex filter takes the the is a is kind of a, a functional thing. It takes the the lexer, and it puts a new state machine on top of that thing. Uh, which is called a lex filter, and the lex filter adjusts the stream of tokens uh, according to the rules of the indentation aware syntax of F sharp. And uh, what and this is part of there's a whole chapter in the F sharp spec about how the lex filter kind of works and the kind of transformation it does of the stream of tokens. So this part here, this lexa.token is also in the F-sharp spec about tokenization, and then the lex filter is about how we adjust the stream of tokens. And then we have a tokenizer, uh, which is actually just of type lex filter in this case. And you can keep calling the lexa of basically get token function. This should be called get token really in here. Get token like this, but it's called lexa. And you can get a token and you can sit in a while loop and you can print those out and it actually just exits when you get end of file. Okay, not the prettiest code, definitely not the prettiest code at all. Very, very old code, it kind of evolved over time. So let's just take a look at this. I've probably got a file called a.fs. Let's take a look at the code of a.fs. And you can see here's some random F sharp code. It will, this thing. Uh, 
so it's open that up with some ra fairly random F sharp code. It's got an open system struct, blah, blah, blah. And we can see here the tokens coming out. And let's take a look what we get out of this thing here. Quite a long stream of tokens. So we're getting one token. The very first thing is there's no magic at the beginning. Uh, it skips over the line and we get the open token. We get an identifier token here. We get a, okay, now this is a, the sort of, anytime there's an O on the front, that really means a token that comes from the Lex filter, that comes from the hard, uh, the, from, the, from the indentation aware syntax of F sharp. And so it puts in a special token, O block sep, at when basically <clears throat> when you, every time you have a sort of sequence of things, so uh, that when the next construct here starts on the same position as the previous line, then we get one of these O block sep tokens being put into the, into the token stream. So it's a separator of a block for the indentation aware syntax. All right, and then you'll see, you'll see the LBRAC less token that corresponds to this part here. Then you'll see another identifier here, then another greater RBRAC here for this token here. Then you'll see the O block sep for this kind of structured, structured sequence of things. And then you'll see the O let. Now, because the let keyword is special to the indentation aware syntax, it's transformed a let token into a, uh, uh, an O let token. And if someone wants to go in, it would make sense to add a different test flag to the compiler at this point here, which was this is pre lex filter tokenize or something like that. Uh, and you could imagine the compiler flag here being uh, pre lex filter tokenize or something like that. That's not going to work, but uh, and then you would see the token stream before the transformation by the lex filter. Right, uh, but that, that flag is not in there yet, so we're looking at that post transformed one. Okay, so you'll see that let has been transformed into an O let. Where were we up here? O let. Then we have a left parenthesis, uh, which is there because these tokens all get passed separately. And then you see a bar, ident bar, underscore bar. And then you'll see this right parent coming soon. Uh, thing here, which is a stream uh, because um, historically we've had some problems with error recovery at uh, certain closing constructs uh, like uh, right parentheses or and a few others. Then we decided uh, somewhere in the process of fixing some bugs to to make the token stream that was coming out of the the sort of adjusted token stream. Uh, have some extra tokens that are put in in order to kind of say, actually, parser, we're going to give these tokens over to the parser soon. And it kind of says, actually, uh, there's a certain construct coming soon. And it gives a chance for certain error recoveries to kick in or not kick in uh, along, along the way. And uh, so you can see it's a fairly kind of messy. Yeah, it's not part of the, the actual token stream coming out here that we're seeing is not part of the F sharp language specification in the sense we are free to do whatever we like with this token stream at this particular point. Uh, the, uh, it, at least it can have these extra kind of tokens and information kind of coming through as long as the, the parser, which we'll talk about soon, actually kind of gets rid of those uh, properly. Um, and then when we actually get the right parenthesis, we emit the emit that token. Then we go through and do left parenthesis, ident, colon, ident, and then we go through the process again. Uh, and one other construct is just before the if, we get an equals, then an O block begins. Uh, so part of the process of, D, of taking out the indent, indentation aware syntax is that we get an O block begin token here and an O block end token, uh, sort of inserted logically speaking, sort of there, we can say. 
around uh, this is the, the the combination of the let and the equals uh, m means it knows that they have to be balanced. So if there's an e if there's a let, there always is going to be a, a corresponding equals in well formed F sharp code, and in those cases, it 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 is going to to put a O block in at the at the alignment with the uh, the first token after the equals. So that if this thing was here, for example, on the, in the straight line, then the O block begin, I'll put them underneath, uh, is sort of, well, it's sort of put there. You can kind of think of it as that, it's kind of like this. And then uh, it's act, the thing that triggers the end of the expression is the fact that we have something offside from that uh, O block begin. Something has caused this sort of stack of of things to be closed, and that's what caused the O block end to be uh, to be emitted. And obviously, once we've got these kind of tokens in there, it's very obvious to later parsing to see how the uh, the indentation aware is being resolved. Indentation aware syntax. Okay. Right. So that's the basics of, of a token stream. Uh, you can use, you should definitely use this tokenize command line option as a very, it's my first, if I have to go and modify the Lexa. It's my first way of checking that things are things are working properly. Uh, a reminder that if you want to run the compiler that you've built, uh, then the way to do that, and you just want to do it from the command line, uh, it's going to be hanging out in this kind of directory. Okay, so I was running the. Uh, let's do this. Again. There. And okay, so that's running that. So previously, when if uh, I was actually running the installed F sharp compiler, because I'm on a uh, uh, Visual Studio 2019 internal preview. It's installed on my eDrive uh, preview there. So that, that's what I was running with FSC. Uh, here is how you run the command line compiler that you've built. And to do a build, of course, you just do .NET build, and, th and that will give you up this compiler here. And you can start to play with it and modify things, add new command line flags, and uh, do whatever you like. I, I tend to run the .NET 472 one, the .NET Framework one, I do that uh, because the the net core app one just there is a net core app here 3.1 and there is an fsc.exe but you can't run those you have to run those using sort of dot net okay uh, and some I, I don't know I just find uh, I can just uh, I don't know maybe it's an old an old old-fashioned thing, I just tend to run that net 4721. Uh, sooner or later, we'll stop building those perhaps and and always use the net core one in, a, in the product. That's a separate matter, but uh, at the, that's just what I do. You, you do whichever ones you like. If you need to debug the compiler, the way I, I do it is actually just because I'm just kind of working at this level of like putting inputs in and type checking small code and so on. I don't want to have to set up a whole Visual Studio or Visual Studio code environment or anything like that. Uh, I tend to just in, use this incantation to start the debugger on the compiler. Uh, I won't do it now. What I'll do is I'll start a .NET build on, hmm, did that work? Uh, stop that. We'll set that going, and then and then I'll be able to debug uh, once it's freshly built. I didn't build it before we got started. 
Uh, okay, so there we go. Tokenization and the the, the streams. Okay, so what, what's producing these tokens? I said there were two parts. There was the Alexa and the uh, Lex filter. So let's take a look at the Alexa. Uh, just a And here is the specification of the Lexa. That's lex.fsl. And as many of you will know, there's a tool called fslex, which is not on my command line, but I'll bring up the project here. Nope, no. fslex. So it's this tool here. Okay, so um, so the uh, okay, so the Lexa is a the Lexa specification follows this kind of. Uh, specification. So you have some header, which is just some normal F sharp code. And then you have some rules of a which specify effectively as a, a state machine, a finite state machine. And uh, they you have the keyword rule. And then you have some entry point for like getting a token. And then you have some parsing rules to and then regular expressions. And then when those regular expressions match a token, it takes an action to produce a token. Uh, for, from the stream. And you can have multiple entry points. You have rule, rule, and rule. And these can call each other in a kind of recursive kind of way. So that, for instance, when you have one rule that starts a string, you can then go into the kind of string state. And you can, uh, and you can, so parse them around. Let's take a look at a little bit of a uh, longer example. Uh, so here, as I say, you have a rule that's going to produce a token, and then you have a keyword parse, and then you have a bunch of regular expressions. You can have, now this is not F sharp code, this is uh, FS Lex code. As I said, you could have some F sharp code at the top, and these bits and pieces in the middle have to be F sharp code, but the rest is a different language. It just happens to look a bit like F sharp. And so these are specifications of regular expressions. And uh, this is, for instance, a regular expression as well, which is just that those sequence of characters one by one. And it FSLex takes this specification, and you could just interpret the specification, but it's obviously better to compile this specification, and it compiles it down to a finite state machine. And what does that mean? Okay, let's take let's dig into what that means. Uh, so let's take a look at this Lexa dot token function. Oh, we can't, and that is in the generated Lexa. So this is where we probably crash Visual Studio while uh, trying to open a file that is. It's a big file, but it's it's uh, 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 it has some very long lines. I would I would assume. Okay, so let's take a look at the the uh, token function here. So this is the generated code uh, for the F sharp tokenizer, and every time we get a token, we are calling this function. And how do, what does it do? It says Oh, okay. It's actually a state machine, and it says we're in state 356, and go and look up these tables and work out what state we should go to next. Okay, what uh, what action we should take, and then it's not what state we should take, but what um, which rule we should follow. Uh, so we can dig into this interpret function and it's interpreted with respect to these fslex tables and the tables have these two parts which are translations and actions 
And you can see that they're big, sparse tables. There's a lot of emptiness in those tables, to be honest. When you look at look at that, uh, and the the actual data format of these tables is quite complex, because what they have what it has to encode is effectively what we're going to do for every single Unicode character that might come our way. Okay, and uh, that is yeah you, you might be asking yourself how can that be how can we uh, encode all the unicode characters in here and the answer is is that the first hundred something like this i i need to look up the details we, we can take a, a closer look in a moment but the first if we're in state zero then the first 128 um entries indicate what to do with ascii characters as we get different ascii characters coming in and then the rest of the columns are, uh, are either specific Unicode characters or categories of Unicode characters, uh, such as uh, identifier characters or digits and white space and the like. And so those categories, there's some encoding of those uh, at the end of the pairwise or something like this or uh, at the end of this uh, section. So at each point in each state, when we get one character, one Unicode character, we have to know what to do with that character and which state to go for. And now some of these states represent terminal states, which say, hey, go do an action because we've reached the end of the token. And so using that intuition, we should be able to go and look at the magic interpret function because it's going to interpret the tables given a state given a lex buffer to get more characters from, and it's going to return an action to perform. So we can look at interpret, just searching for it, and, uh, and that is in prim lexing. And the key part here is scan until we reach a, a, a sentinel. You can see that each row of the table for the lexer has those entries, 128 ASCII characters, a variable number of specific Unicode characters, and 30 entries, one for each Unicode category. Uh, of course, if you know your Unicode, you'll know that Unicode divides the world up into digits and other things. We can see that by doing, let's see, equal A, the character A, and then you can, so I see, uh, Ah, oh, the, oh it's, it's, it's done differently. System dot char dot. That's these sort of things. Is it a control character? Is it a letter? Is it a digit? And so so on. And I think get Unicode ca category for the character will tell you. And then you can see system dot globalization dot Unicode category. You can see the different categories for the 30 different kinds under here. OK, so that's the table format. And you might say, who on earth produced that table? And that's FSLex over here. So let's even look at the source code for FSLex. And dig on down to FSLex, and we'll see the place here where it produces that table. And I'm just going to search for the place where it starts to print out those tables. Uh, and this is where it starts to print those out. And you can kind of see this if we're doing Unicode, then get specific Unicode characters and start to pr print out the states of the finite automata and work out the transitions and emit them and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's all that kind of code here. And you can see uh, the low Unicode characters, specific Unicode characters, and Unicode categories. Uh, we just print out that file. Uh, OK, so this is what is producing those, has analyzed all those regular expressions and effectively compiled those regular expressions down to this table format and then emitted this information. OK. Sorry, where have I gone? Here, FSLex. Right, so let's go back to Visual Studio and look at, we're looking at interpret. And that was explaining this thing here. 
So there is now there's a hard link here in that there's code in the F# -sharp compiler which uh, assumes that table format. And we, we also have that stuff in FSLex, which is producing that table format. And so you can't just go and change that table format without going and changing this code, primlexing. We effectively, we, we copied an, a copy of the interpreter for uh, that, those tables uh, into the F# -sharp compiler at some point because we, we wanted to reduce our dependency on that FSLex re, re, repository. We still, we probably have a copy of those, uh, those tools copied into our repository at some point. Um, I've forgotten the exact status. And we have to actually have those in order to be able to build the F# -sharp compiler for source, which is without relying on those sort of binary compiled tools coming from the outside we, where we legally have to be able to compile it all up from source. Okay, so the core part of the Lexing interpreter is scan and tell Sentinel. And it this uh, lex buffer and it's in a this is all in an object called unicode tables and those are those um those big fat arrays of numbers uh at the top here and so we have access to those and you can see that we can look well we do some things first and if we we check if we've hit the end of the lex buffer we refill the buffer uh we check some condition about after refill otherwise we find the character where which we're at we look up the unicode characters find the new state and this is going to be follow the structure of the table is it an ascii character in which we go look at look up the the, the tables so the transition table straight away Otherwise, we go and we loop around looking for the right Unicode character and uh, under the various options for looping around and and that's that. And then we get a, a new state coming out. And if we've hit a sentinel, we say, hey, we're done. We've got a we've got a token. OK, and otherwise we just, you know, just pump, bump an integer and continue around the loop. And that is that is that. That's how we produce tokens end to end. So now we can go and look at our Alexa file and start to look. And here's here's the start. Where are we here? Here's the start of our regular expressions here. These slash L represent the different Unicode categories uh, for letters. Uh, for there's a whole range of different letters, uppercase, lowercase, and whatever else. So you can see a hex digit, and, uh, uh, and uh, op uh, these are the characters allowed in F# -sharp operators. These are characters which used to be allowed in F# -sharp operators, but are no longer allowed in quite the same way. They're kind of reserved for things like string interpolation. And then we build up regular expressions for things like uh, hexadecimal specifications of integers and uh, blah, 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 floating point numbers and so on. Uh, what escape characters are allowed um, in, in F sharp? You're allowed to do things like slash u a uh, dead beef, something like this. And that will be a character in the Unicode, uh, a Unicode long graph for that character, uh, represent a single character, okay, uh, using a Unicode number, and so on. Okay. Uh, and finally, we get to what forms an identifier. We have to, we, um, we have, well, identifiers start with a letter or an underscore and then have a bunch of other combinations uh, characters connecting characters format combining formatting and digits and then prime primes at the end here so that's how we've got our regular expressions and these pretty much correspond to what's in the f -sharp language specification and now we have our, our token rule and it just follows what we said before and this is the thing that gets compiled down to those tables and we have the regular expression for identifiers, or we have various keywords coming in here. And the code inside an FSLex ac action can either call another rule or it can return a token. 
OK, so if we look the and now these will correspond to the cases in the generated code. So if we've come across here, the first case here and you'll see the line numbers being emitted here to say this bit of code actually came from that other file at that particular line. And this is the code and you'll see how that. So when we call the tokenizer, we interpret, we get a we get a, a sentinel. We, we say which thing did we produce and we go and we produce a particular token. Cool, that's it. No more magic. Right, some, some of these things might fail here, so that's important here, and that's going to produce an error message here, blah, blah, blah. And it's, uh, uh, we'll, we'll talk about failure in a bit. Uh, and what else is interesting here? Um, sometimes we process the, uh, the, the the tokens a little bit. Um, sometimes we have some artificial tokens to do with um, common things that end up people end up typing that cause would cause strange you know, that would have to work a little bit harder to identify those cases. So we've identified a case here that people often kind of put dot in this kind of position. I know the, and this is, um, well, uh, well, actually, the, 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 the key part here is that it's, no, this is actually an important token because we have the two, it's not just error recovery or anything. It's actually that we don't want, we want, both dots to be consumed in this because we might be doing an expression like zero to three and uh we don't want the longer token by definite by in in this setting the longest token not, not normally matches and we don't and zero dot is also a valid token but we don't want that one we we, we so we actually take in this case we take this as an entire token and we later split that apart in the lex filter we split that into two tokens so we clean up some glitches in how things interact at this point. Uh, okay, what else is interesting? Yeah, so we process some things like removing some underscores. When you're in a Lexa uh, uh, fragment, you get access to um, the context. You get access to the Lex buffer, and that's because it's just an, in this co context here. It's just an R in the generated code here, that, that argument. <coughs> and that means you can get the actual text that was matched here. We haven't got a number yet, so we've just got the text, and so we get that. And we actually trim a couple of characters off the right of this. And we then remove the underscores, and then we convert it to a, a, an integer. Uh, an unsigned 64-bit integer, and if that fails, if you put in too big a number, then we give an error here, etc. Okay, so all the way down. Now, sometimes we'll get to a case shortly. Take a look at here. So let's say you've got the start of a string. Now it's not just a string; it is actually a uh, interpolated string here. So this is if somebody was typing in something like dollar bang bang bang, hello um, one plus one, bang bang bang, something like that. Does ignore. So let's say we have this token here. So we part, we, we, we get that. Now we don't try and grab the whole string in one go, okay? That's uh, that that doesn't work out well. So we just grab the first part, but we don't produce a token yet. What we do, just ignoring this part, is we do a, a, a triple. We go to the triple quote string state. First, we check some condition about nesting, uh, but we'll just ignore that. But what's really happening here is this part here, triple quote string. And triple quote string is another rule that we call. And, and in the compiled code, it just becomes a set of recursive functions. So let's uh, look at that here, this triple quote string. And so we can go down to the triple quote string rule. And for example, the thing might be immediately closed such as three closing quotes. 
Okay, great. Well, that's cool because now we can actually produce a token. Uh, and by, we do that by doing this calling this finish finish function on the string buffer of the string that we're building up and this fin thing here, the string finisher it's called, is what uh, allows us to finish off the, uh, the string. Okay, uh, so I think that's all I want to say on tokenization. Uh, there is weirdness to do with Unicode all the way through. Uh, for instance, in Unicode, you might be using emoji or something like that. And so you might get these surrogate character pairs that, are, that sort of always come in pairs like this. Uh, there's a lot you can track through and look through anything mentioning Unicode to see how that works. Okay, uh, so that is the Lex. Now, uh, just to mention, there's an important library of stuff that gets used during the Lexing process. Uh, that is in this lexhelp.fsi, that's help for the Lexa. Uh, helpers for the Lexa. And some of the things we've been looking at have actually come from this library. I talked about a string finisher here that, um, and uh, you've seen some of these helpers being called along the way that builds up uh, kind of records fragments of the inputs across into in the tokenization. And you can, each of these have a corresponding feature in the Lexa. You can see tables of keywords here and you can go through and look at their implementations if you like uh, and then all the way through we have a single object which is this mutable record in this setting uh, which is this lexa arguments and we uh, some of them are, are constants through the whole process of lexing and some of them get mutated along the way so these are stacks of these two uh, stacks of things. These are the, these are the stacks of the, the sort of hash if hash, hash if def stacks here. If you do a hash if and and so on, hash if sorry, hash if abc hash end if sort of thing. So then as the lex is coming down, lexing, 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 then the lexargs will get an entry pushed on it for the if def stack. Now these are mutable, but the, their contents are not mutable. And that's very important because there's something crucial we have to be able to do with this lexer, which is that the lexer doesn't just lex the entire file. And especially when you're in Visual Studio or F Sharp compiler service or in JetBrains Rider, you don't lex the whole file, you lex fragments of the file, just the visible fragments. So that means when we're sitting here in an IDE, uh, and I mean, it has to start at the top because there might've been some hash ifs and everything. So it will have, uh, and let's say we just open the file at this point. Well, the IDE is going to say, please, it's going to say, let's start tokenizing that file. And it calls the F Sharp compiler service entry point for tokenization. Let's have a look at what that is. And let's, so let's, so this is um, often in, in, when you're working in the F Sharp compiler, there's this kind of switch that happens when you, you think for a while in terms of command line compiling and whole files and traditional compilers. And then you go, whoa, let's think about everything from the point of view of the IDE from the development environment. And then uh, a different set of intuitions need to apply in your head. And that's kind of what I'm going to sort of segue over to now. So let's look at to tokenizing lexing in uh, from the compiler service point of view. So this is the compiler service API. So all the IDEs sit on this thing, and it's an alternative view of the functionality that we've had. And the key thing is it's got this F# -sharp source tokenizer. And the key thing there is really create line tokenizers. So you can to ask for just the tokenizers of tokenization of particular lines. And that is F sharp line tokenizer. And you can ask for each line, you can say, scan me a token. And it says, oh, well, tell me the state you are in last time, and I'll give you back a new token, possibly, and a new state. Okay, 
So you can sit there just throwing lines. You can write this code yourself using the F-Sharp compiler service API, if you like. Uh, and there, are, uh, and you can sit there writing your own tokenization loops and processing the tokens and so on. Uh, now, the the problem is, if you're in an IDE, and let's say we tokenize up until line 276, well, this tokenizer Lexus state is kind of going to record the fact that we're still in a comment at that point. Because if we if we need to now request the tokenization of the next line, which is here, then we need to continue. Well, it's not in a comment because it's the end of line, but let's say this was like this. Okay, then you'll notice it tokenized this line and then it said, okay, I'm gonna do the next line. Ah, it knows it's green, okay, it knows it's in a comment. And so we have the, uh, so this tokenizer lex state is an important bit of, uh, uh, can, it's, it must represent the continuation of the entire tokenization process. Now, that notion that it's a continuation is absolutely crucial if you're going to dig around in this code uh, at all, because um, you, you really have to be able to capture the continuation of the whole thing. And that means if you're in the middle of a comment, if you're in the middle of nested comments, if you're in the middle of a hash if or nested hash if, or if you're in the middle of an interpolated string, you've got to be able to capture the continuation. And I don't mean a function. You have to be able to store because you don't want to. You don't want to capture. You don't want to store a million. Like we've got to store that continuation basically for the end of every line in the IDE. There's going to be a continuation value, uh, and that's got to be an efficient representation of the continuation of tokenization. The other thing that's important is that the uh, tokenizer has to produce white space as well. The um, it has to produce comments which normally the rest of the compiler don't care, doesn't care much about, except XML comments. And it's got to produce um, uh, other, other bits and pieces of, of, of white space. So that is important. And so these tokens that come out might also include white space. So if we go back to the Lexa, that will help explain things. Uh, if we're, so this skip flag here says, are we skipping white space or not? If we're not skipping white space, then we want to see a much more fine-grained view of the uh, of, of the lexing. We could have written two different lexes, one with white space and one without, but we have one white space, but this one coughs, coughs up extra tokens, and it, it and those tokens contain the continuation for how to give that of that content. So if we look at comment, for example, here that if we're in if we're in a comment. Uh, this is uh, then you might get like a single character from the comment and then say, hey, that was a bit of a comment. And then you have a continuation to say, yeah, you want to keep parsing, you want to keep lexing, continue on with the comment. So that's what this lex cont structure is. Okay. Let's so that that's getting towards the end of what we want to do for tokenization. Uh, how about we pause and take questions at this point in time let me bring up the uh the list of things here now that all of that code as you can see a lot of the code is quite old it's messy it's great uh and it's kind of old back to sort of 2003 2005 heritage for the start of a very start of f sharp obviously the first thing you write is alexa and I'd love to kind of keep going through and cleaning it up and getting the names to be look a, look a lot better, uh, look a lot more like modern F sharp code. Uh, we can continue to please help and be a part of cleaning up that code and make putting it uh, on a long term sustainable kind of basis. Uh, and let's take a look at conversation and comments. Okay. What's the conceptual benefit of being able to compare the raw token stream to the filtered one? Uh, I, I guess the if you're working in the Lexa and you, you don't care about the Lex filter, you're just working in the Lexa and you want to know that you're getting the right tokens coming out at that level, 
uh, given the specification you've written and you're trying to debug something there, it can be kind of useful not to look at the Lex filter, which we haven't looked at at all yet today. I guess we can look at it in a bit. Uh, and just it's just about like narrowing down the, um, the the code that you're sitting on. Yeah, it's not as messy as the filtered one. Uh, okay, right. So yes, Will was very happy with the beef comment. I'm very glad of that. Uh, okay, if you're recreate for what technology? I actually don't know what technology algorithm for parsing. I just use a recursive descent parser, a set of functions that uh, that that process uh, the street a token stream. For the Lexa, I don't I don't know. I might just use FS Lex. I, I kind of Will Will might have an opinion on on that, uh, but. For me, given the size of those regular expressions and their complexity, the interaction with Unicode and everything, I, I, I never, never personally want to do that again. But I'm happy with um, with FSLex. Yeah, I'm kind of happy with FSLex. It's 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 okay. But the use of FSYAC is more questionable. Definitely questionable. <coughs> How? Yes, error recovery. Uh, so that is going to be a topic we can talk about, and maybe we can uh, sort of flip across to that. If we were to yes, handwrite the lexicon, Will says he'd handwrite the lexicon parser. I'm not, parsing definitely would be recursive descent. Uh, and yes, you can look at the C, the C sharp lexa, uh, it's fine. Uh, any pointers on, say, emitting the generated FS Lex Yak tokenizer in terms of tree sitter grammars? Uh, I don't. Do you mean like attribute grammars? Is that right? I don't. Uh, my, it's been a. I don't actually know what a tree sitter grammar is. So, uh, but I, 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 I don't. So is that something that sort of incrementally keeps a tree up to date. Anyway, we can we can talk about that offline perhaps because I don't know. Uh, uh, how see shall verify puzzle for correctness. Uh, right. It's looking okay. Philip said that for lunch. Is there a, is there a plan to spanify FS Lex and FS Yak? Well Will might have a plan to do that. He's always got plans to make things faster. Uh, but it is absolutely true that you can, we probably, yeah. Uh, yes, you can spanify it in some in some way to avoid copying out tokens uh, from the stream and uh, other such, such things, I think. Uh, but I don't know if we really need to. Lexing and token, lexing and parsing is not a huge performance problem for us. I would say. I mean, I'd say memory usage of later phases in the uh, compiler uh, are more of a problem. Uh, and Will's been working a lot on those. Um, but the raw performance of lexing and parsing is actually really not not too bad, and it uh, uh, doesn't. You know, I think the it's it seems to be acceptable for the way people work in the IDE tools we're working in today. So, and Will says parsing is very fast. That's good to know. Okay, so we're not going to be able to have time to go into um, full depth on all the other aspects. So the the first we could take a glance at is the Lex filter. Now the Lex filter needs a, a, an FSI file. And it's a big bit of code, and it definitely deserves to have an FSI a sig um, signature file. So if anybody wants to go and create that for Lex filter, that'd be a great uh, a great thing to do. There is something you can do uh, in the compiler, which is the uh, minus i flag to the compiler, which nobody ever uses. So let's just. Uh, this is for creating signature files. Let's just create this code f of x one. And if you do fsc minus i, it actually prints out the signature of the compiled code. Uh, and you can actually do, I think, dot sig or something like this, dot sig file or something. 
uh, if it's soon, I should help. Does this have minus here dash dash sig? You can do dash dash sig uh, a dot text or something like that, and look at a dot text, and you can see that you can see this is an old feature. It's not really used very much by people. Uh, it could be the basis of an IDE feature uh, for 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 the development environments where you have a right click add signature file, uh, and that could be much more fully featured from that. It could include the comments, for example, if I had a comment that was coming in here, hello, like that. Uh, then at the moment that doesn't come out in the signature file, and yes, you could imagine that it's just as simple as going right click add signature file and everything just works. But in short of that, if you want to create a signature file for one of these things and then it'll it'll be, it'll be messy. It won't be perfect, but you can use the FSC minus I or dash dash sig option. Uh, you can just add that to your project file like here and come along here and do other flags and do dash dash sig uh, a dot text or something like this, then work out where that actually ends up. Go looking for it, do a compile, work out where that ends up, copy out the parts you want and start to edit and add the signature file. So uh, we need a signature file for LexFilter uh, and without a signature file, I, I don't think I'm even going to go through this today. I, I, I tell you what, I, I, I mean, you don't, I, I want to look at one bug that we had come in. Uh, and I'm, I'm probably not going to fix it, but I'm going to point out where, see if we can hunt down where the fix is likely to be. So we had this bug come in, which is about anonymous records give incorrect indentation warning. <clears throat> so if you see some code that uses records here, OK, and some corresponding code that uses anonymous records. Then you get an indentation warning here where you don't get it here. This is an what we call an undentation, an allowed undentation that this this is allowed to start anywhere back from left of the of the brace. But you don't get it here. Now, what's the difference between these? The difference is actually very small, which is just the difference in these tokens. So the bug has to be somewhere uh, in the process, the difference between processing right brace tokens and right brace bar tokens. So let's just go and look at those. Let's look at the Lex filter and let's take a look at where we process right brace tokens here. <coughs> and uh, and so you can see that, that there's some things about like, is this a continuator of this? And well, I mean, already here, you can see we might have missed some things with anonymous records because in principle, these could be like this, okay? And you say, oh, well, there's a test case we can write out. And when we go and fix this bug, we'll, we'll, we will go and do that. But it's almost certainly the case that pretty much everywhere where we have an Arbrose, thing, we should actually have an Arbrose bar as well, except why is that coming up? Uh, so this is Elbrose, right? This is bar. So this is, so we have this one here is Elbrose bar, and this one here is bar Arbrose, the, the sequence of the characters. OK, so that's that was my problem here. So this should be bar R brace should probably be in that specification. So let's take a look at the next R brace. Ah, look, that one does have the corresponding ones here. That's good. And this one has both ones there. This one has both ones there. This one has both R brace and there. This one, hmm, after a width or uh, this is uh, looking at this. It's, it's quite possible this should also be a bar arbrace, so uh, we can talk about that one separately. 
uh, and let's sorry, just, just go through all of these again. Uh, this one and this one here. So this probably just follow, all of these should just follow exactly the same pattern and we should probably just do, just for the sake of uniformity, just chuck in some new tokens to make it everything be the same for those particular cases. <coughs> and we would do the same with L brace, left, left brace here. And we'll go through and check, uh, this is to do with join syntax. This is to do with, uh, okay. So this one to me looks exactly like where the bug will be because we, again, we just expect there to be a corresponding L brace bar token here. Uh, we probably expect that to be the same there because we just expect these to be processed in exactly the same way all the way through. And uh, this is exactly the kind of place where we're processing the indentation aware syntax for those constructs and this thing should have a, a case on it there. Okay, so that's just to say how we might go through and fix a bug in lexing and filtering uh, where a, a new language construct doesn't match the behavior we expect, but we can use the implementation for an old language construct as a guide to fixing the problem. Okay, let's undo all of that. Okay, I'll take questions on that. Uh, I'll see if there's any questions. Do we have any questions, Evlad? No, nothing, nothing new. From, from what I okay, see. great. Okay, cool. Uh, so we took a very, uh, a look through the Lex filter. Now we took a, a different kind of look there. We didn't try to understand the Lex filter. We tried to check that the Lex filter was doing the same thing for one kind of token as another kind of token. And that's a perfectly valid way to come to the compiler is rather than trying to understand the whole thing, you look for these uniformity conditions across the compiler, especially when, you're when you've already proved to yourself that these things aren't operating in the same way, you go and just do a search and for those tokens or, or similar and try and find out why, why, where the difference is kind of arising. Okay, so that's the Lex filter. Uh, now, we want to talk about parsing. I guess another, I'll, I will talk about one thing, which is that the Lex filter, uh, so the Lexa <coughs> uh, does uh, deal with triple slash comments xml.comments uh, slightly differently. It doesn't capture those, but it um, puts, let's see, uh, line comment, single line comment. So it'll be the, at the end of the single line comment here, here, this line here, that when we, we've been processing a single line comment and we get to a new line, we say try save the XML doc uh, that we've been building up in this buffer along the way. And this emits the XML doc into, um, well, you can, tr you can track down what it does, but it, 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 it throws it out uh, in, uh, into a separate output stream, into a separate table. Uh, and then the parser comes and picks those up and turns them into these constructs, these XML doc on these unprocessed lines here. Uh, now, some of the feature work we've been doing in the compiler is to make XML doc comments uh, a little bit better. So for instance, if you put in uh, summary tags here, then you'll get the, uh, you're now told that the XML comment is invalid and that you're, uh, you, you need to do more work. Okay, uh, and so on, and, and do various post-processing on those XML docs. So just to say, it's not just about tokenizing the stream, it's also about how we treat comments and what processing we do on comments. And there are, there, 
There's two things I'd like to mention for like long term things that maybe the community can also take a lead on. One is that there, there are uh, we are still not at feature parity compared to C Sharp on XML.comments. That uh, if you uh, put things like C refs uh, in this kind of thing, uh, I've forgotten what the, the actual context is, but these these things should be processed. You can see how C Sharp does these, but we don't process or check those. Uh, you can do um, things like system object or something or T. I uh, know oh it's called C also T ref or C. It's called C ref equals system object. You should be able to write that, uh, and you can write that uh, in in F sharp, but uh, it's not a properly formed XML doc, and it's not checking that. You actually have to put the T colon in here to, which is the sort of the compiled form. C sharp lets you do that, and even better, C sharp lets you uh, refer to other types in here. Okay, so you could do F sharp dot compiler dot compiler dot range dot range or something like that which would be uh, see that particular type and you actually get highlighting on these and you get, uh, these are symbols. You can, re if I do a rename refactor on this range thing, this will actually go and adjust the comment as well. And it, and it understands open namespaces. So you could get rid of all of that because that is open and you can just do that. And this will uh, be colored like this this range here and you can yeah, do rename refactoring and symbol highlighting and so on. It would be great to have that co that feature in the compiler uh, and it's it's not simple to implement but it'd be but it'd be good to have. The other thing is that wouldn't it be lovely if we could actually do uh, mark markdown uh, so this thing and then you could just use some sort of like just maybe just do this. Or something like that. Uh, some sort of sort of markdown document specification. Um, uh, maybe you have to maybe you have to qualify this thing in here. Uh, and you could use uh, markdown tables, indentation, etc. You could there'd be some way of like writing out param parameters. Now some other languages have this, uh, and it's obviously uh, a nice way to go uh, to. However, however the thing gets gets done, da, 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 da. whatever the spec is. But I'd love to see Markdown comments uh, be in the core of the F Sharp tooling. The community have added them on the outside at the FS Docs uh, F Sharp formatting layer. But uh, you know, it'd be great since we're at the very front end of the compiler. It'd be really lovely if we had a, a, a proper Markdown document specification uh, comment specification. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm actually surprised C Sharp hasn't added that already. I wouldn't be surprised if it does get added to C Sharp at some point because it's obviously just a much nicer way of writing documentation in code. Okay, so that's on XML docs. Um, you can see the checking. This is new in F Sharp 5, the checking we do on XML docs, uh, member doc check. And it parses and checks the documents, and you can check out what it does there. Uh, okay, let's take a look for questions. No more questions. That's okay. So uh, we should take a look at the parser. Um, So what do we want to know about the parser? All right. So the parser is specified in this yak file. <clears throat> Let's just talk a bit about FS yak and how it works. Okay, so here's the parser. So the parser is given the LexFilter stream. So it's given a function it can use to get tokens. And if we go to FS Yak, 
Let's see next slide. And just take a basic look. OK, uh, <clears throat> so this is a this is a small FS YAC input file. And it has some F sharp code at the top. It has a specification of the entry points, the start token, the start rules. And then it has the specification of the tokens that the parser, that form part of the parser input. And it generates a token type for that. And some of the tokens carry data, which is what these things are. So this is in a way a specification of an F-sharp discriminated uh, F-sharp union type. And it, you give some type annotations for the entry point. And then you have the rules here. And each of these are a non-terminal on the left, and then a list of either terminals or non-terminals. So that's the to that's tokens, terminals, same thing. And then so we have token, token, non-terminal, token. And then once that construct has been satisfied, so if we had a single uh, statement that was a single print followed by a single identifier, then you would expect to see this, this F sharp code executed. You would have this F sharp code executed, and then you would put together a single list of those things. That would be a program which would then execute this, which would give you your overall prog data structure, which is in this set of types up here. You'd get one of those things coming back. So it's a way of turning a token stream into structured data. Uh, OK, this. Um, you can read about the command line options. You can read about what you can do in the um, to. OK, so as you're sitting on this token stream, you have to also get information out about where the tokens were in the original source code file. So the tokens will carry information about where line number information, line location information. And uh, you can you can access that inside these grammars, inside these parts of the grammar. OK, so what happens to this? Well, we also get tables. We get a lot of tables coming out, and I'm not going to cover this. But if we opened up pars.fsy, that's probably really will crash for sure. This is a huge file. Uh, yeah, 16,000 lines long. And it is also, well, it's a whole bunch of F sharp code from the top. Here's our generated token type here which is the token type of the compiler that we've been seeing all the way along. Uh, and we get an identifier thing, and it generates some other types, one for each non-terminal in the grammar, uh, all the way down. It gives you some functions to get a turn a token into a tag. It also lets you turn it into a token ID here. And it a uh, similar thing for each of the, okay. So each of these lines is called a production. Okay. And uh, so for each of the productions, we, uh, we, we have one different non-terminal saying which, which rule were we actually, uh, was that production a part of? all the way down and finally uh, some more code for turning things to and from strings and finally we get the actual generated tables now the, some of these lines are very very long indeed this is uh, 100,000 uh, characters long this line that is a massive line that's the longest line you're ever going to see uh, there we go. There's a longer one, 274,000 lines long. So these are big tables, and they're not even split over multiple lines. <clears throat> and yak, and it's quite complicated. We can't go into it, but you get the idea from what the Lexa was doing. There is an interpreter, 
so do we have yes there's an interpreter here there's uh, these are the overall tables here and uh, these are the entry points you can parse a signature file you can parse an implementation file you can parse an interaction you can parse an expression or you can parse a type uh, and uh, each of those go through and um, call the parser interpreter with those tables with a different entry state here. OK, so we can look at the parser interpreter. We can do prim parsing. Let's look at its signature. So this is the state that's available at any particular point in uh, in those productions. So you can find out, well, you can go through and read those comments. And then this was the table type. These are all those big fat arrays of numbers and these are the reduction functions. And these are the, the lots and lots of integers there. And here's our interpreter. So it sits on the Lexa, sits on the Lex buffer, and it is given an initial state and it returns an object, which is the result of the parsing. Okay. Uh, the final overall result. Now it doesn't know what type it is. So if we go back to that code, that generated code, way at the bottom. It, these actually unbox to the result type. So it's either a parse signature file or a parse implementation file or a parse FSA interaction or in syntax expression or a type. And the, the, this unbox will never fail because of the, the way we've done things up above. Okay. Uh, so let's take a look at the interpreter, the implementation. Uh, and there's a reason I'm going to dig down into this code. So this is the core loop of it. Uh, uh, and you can, where's the actual core loop is here, while not finished do. Okay. And it keeps a, stack of the rules that are active that it's not yet completed on uh, in terms well, it's not the stack of rules, it's a stack of states. And then it uh, sits there trying to get a token here. Here's, a, here's how we get the token and then we work out what action to perform and then it does it does an action and then it, then it does all the rest of the stuff that a, the a yak parser has to do. As, uh, but it sits there reading on the tables, working out what action to do, performing reductions, and all the time we're parsing F sharp code is that this is the call loop that is running. Now the 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 reason I was going to mention this is that uh, what happens when there is an error in the parsing when no rule matches is absolutely key. And in fact, this is a topic that Will and I have been talking about, about, uh, about error recovery in the F-sharp compiler. The F-sharp compiler is, is kind of, sometimes it's not so good at error recovery. Uh, if you look at, um, let, let, let's, Kind of sometimes it is. If I just put in a random token like that, actually not too much damage has been done. Uh, but if I if I put in some weird token, uh, I don't know if I can trigger this. Uh, yeah, these these error recoveries are, are not not too bad. Uh, you can kind of get a measure for how good our error recovery is by how much, but it's putting in random tokens and seeing how much goes how much damage is done to the parsing of the file. Uh, so if we put in some like this, yeah, it's, 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 uh, I haven't yet triggered a case that is sort of doing, doing a bad error recovery. Uh, you can start to just like delete random characters. Yeah, that's not so good. That's actually quite a bad 
uh, sort of missing parenthesis problem is uh, is a significant thing in the compiler. And often that's that's because when we're, we're not doing good enough error recovery, and I, it's Will and I believe that there are fundamental improvements we can make to what happens when there's an error. Uh, so that is in uh, 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 I need to reorient, but somewhere in here, there, there's a there's a there's a category which is like actually I'll, I'm going to find it. This is where we call pop stack until error shifted in here. That's right. So if this is the error case down here. And we just think we're doing the wrong thing in error recovery here. And if someone is really brave, they can come in and try and work out a better way for us to be doing error recovery in this kind of in this kind of setting and uh, maybe changing the logic of what we do in this error recovery at this stage here. So although this is very old code and very um, fundamental code, there are probably some systematic improvements we can still make to get better error recovery for the F sharp compiler, even at this level. OK. OK, so that is the parser interpreter. And then, of course, we have the parser itself. And that is just what we said, just multiplied up 100 times. And we have, for example, um, we saw some of these things before. Let's take a look at an expression expression. Uh, let's take a look at, OK, so here are some of the fundamental constructs of the F-sharp language. Uh, so things in F-sharp 5 match bang, or we have a try finally here, a try finally here, or we have a try with clauses here. And now each of these do have recovery rules, such as this one here which says that if we were had an error and we were able to recover from that error, then uh, then we accept a half a half written version of that construct into the into the input and into what we accept in the grammar. So this is a grammar that's been augmented with a set of error recovery rules. So if you want to know the true grammar of F sharp, you would actually go through and delete all these recovery cases. You get rid of this and you get rid of this one because it's got this recover in here. And then that kind of reduces down to a simpler, a much, much simpler grammar actually. Uh, and you would also actually get rid of Every time there's an O version of the thing, which is for this offside uh, indentation of with syntax, you would get rid of those as well. You get rid of the non uh, the non O version of the thing, uh, and actually the grammar you get by doing that, yeah, is as I say, quite a lot. Simply, you see about half the rules are specifying what to do in error recovery in various cases. Uh, we have four loops, four loops, this one, uh, this is the same thing, we can get rid of that, and so on and so on and so on. So, so if you ever need to, so you can take this parser specification and get a much simpler view of the F sharp language, and then just the rest is just for error recovery. And let's undo that. Right. OK, so par the pars ultimately produces abstract syntax tree nodes, which we've covered in earlier episodes, which is in the syntax tree, which is a fairly nice file these days. We have constants and expressions and types, and then this is a really, yeah, quite a nice specification of the, the syntax for that for the F-sharp language here syntax of types and the syntax of expressions here. OK. So um, just to say one thing about error. Um, uh, there's a magic function in the compiler that does get called. This parse error rich here. 
which is uh, a special name known to FS Yak. And if you go to FS Yak here and we go to the source code and we search for parser rich here, then you'll see that it in uh, in the generated code it actually generates a code expecting there to be a function called parse error rich defined and the reason it does so if we go to the if we go to the generator parser we search for parse error rich there we see that same code and it, it this is what and we look at parse error and we go through to the interpreter then you'll see this call which said this is what happens when an error happens and this is all in the um this is all in the kind of we have had an error kind of uh part of the compiler and it gives across to the parse error handler this big fat error context this parse error context for some particular token type and it gives it tells you the state stack it tells you the lots of the internal state of the effort of fs of, of the of the f sharp parser it tells you the state stack the parsing state the the, the the possible tokens that might be acceptable at this point which we couldn't find one we couldn't find anything acceptable and it tells you what the current token is and what productions are actually valid. So we give this whole big swathe of data across. And there's some processing in the F-sharp compiler, in the error messages in the compiler, which takes this all of this stuff and does something quite useful for it. It's very generic across the entire grammar. So if, for example, I do something that says four, and I don't, for x, let's do x in. Okay, I'm just trying to trigger this. Okay, this this error message here. Unexpected keyword let or use expected this token. Okay. Okay, so now that's a generic error message. That is that is that is the result of this parse error context. This is the information we use to get ultimately get this quite nice error message. Okay, and, that, and um, that bit of generic code, I don't mean generic generics, I mean general code, is in, uh, it must be in uh, compiler diagnostics, I believe. Let's see. Let's try to find this code here. Here, it's a big lot of code in the middle of this function. And it says that if we had a syntax error, then we don't just print syntax error like everybody's first compiler always does. Uh, we instead we uh, we take this parsing error context here and we do a whole lot of processing on it. And if somebody likes uh, grammars and state machines and parsing and the like, and also likes really good error messages, it's quite possible that the we can do a lot more at this stage. What we do is quite good. We should probably separate it out into a separate file so that you can, you can kind of see what what, what happens. Uh, and uh, we we give nice names to all the tokens. That's what all these get error strings is. And and we we go through and say well, we we just look for categories of saying oh look you you you. We, we we expected an implementation file. We sorry, we expected a, a type definition or, or or an if then else or something like this wasn't finished and so on, and uh, and we do some post processing. So we already do quite a lot of work, but it's possible uh, that you can we can do some even nicer work uh, to eventually get 
the um, error message out the end. Uh, these are the um, and these are the final error messages that we produce down the bottom. So although we suffer a lot by using FS Yak uh, in some ways, we also get some benefits from using FS Yak, which is we get this global view of the entire possibilities of the parsing. And we've used that to some extent, but I've always felt that we've never used it uh, to its full extent, that we could probably do even more uh, once something goes wrong. And like there might be smarter ways to do error recovery that are more that, that feed off this information. Uh, there might be all there might be all sorts of things that we can do. And in fact, we might even be able to go and get rid of a whole lot of that uh, parser code because it kind of is all just could possibly be generalized by sort of this is a bit of interpretive code over the structure of the entire grammar. And, you know, it's possible we can do smart things at that point. OK. Right, so we have finally got our way down to uh, the syntax tree nodes. Uh, and I think that is the appropriate place to stop for this week. Uh, we will first take questions. Uh, uh, is there a pragmatic purpose for dumping five soon? Uh, yeah, I've always been skeptical of that. It wasn't put in by me. Uh, and uh, the Will, uh, Will says, yes, the six tokens is arbitrary, but it is uh, for, it's not a quirk of the Lexa. It's absolutely a quirk of the parser and the error recovery strategy that's used in the parser. Uh, and uh, it uh it, it it's probably a different way to do the whole thing is what i've always thought but it does what it does and it it, it works okay for those error recovery cases um okay uh let's take a look okay curious about error recovery so i'm missing parentheses in the binding in the middle of a type definition what are the approaches before recovery so force closing mismatch tokens yeah, okay, Will has answered that question. When it consumes a token, the token is gone forever. Um, that That's right, though. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible we could put in more backtracking into the into the FS YAC interpreter in a general kind of way. Uh, I hope enriching the errors leans more towards fixing the paths rather than surrounding. It. Yes, yes, that's uh, I, I agree with that. We we shouldn't be putting in even more of those kind of coming soon's, uh, except where it's already following the existing pattern. Uh, we've taken that. Okay, I think we've answered those questions. Okay, so. We've done that. We've got it on record. And do we have any more questions from anyone on the call? Uh, it's a, a, quite a lot of technical topics there. In the in, in the practice, uh, you we don't often have to add new features into the parser and Alexa. We've been kind of tweaking around the edges. And probably if you want to see an end-to-end -end feature that has been added, uh, then string interpolation is the place to look. Um, so if we go to the string interpolation RFC uh, and you want to look at the implementation here, so first you, you, you all probably know the feature by now and you probably started to use it and uh, this was the original implementation of string interpolation. And this is an interesting feature because it, it touches both the parser and the Lexa, and it's got testing, a lot, you know, a lot of testing. It adds some token types. Uh, so, for example, let's look at the additions to the Lexa. Uh, it's here. It's actually a big, big long diff to the Lexa. There's a lot of cleanup in the Lexa in order to get things lining up for the different kinds of strings. 
go through and uh, take a look at, at how how things get added. Uh, and, you know, even, even you can see that even the basic processing of like strings gets affected by this feature because we have to put in some checking into this. Yeah. And there's the interpolated string, sort of the new additions coming in here or here. Uh, and OK, and then you can follow through that entire feature end to end if you want to study how to adjust the parser. And even an even simpler one, uh, if you want to start much, much at the much simpler end, uh, check out the the one that allows, I'm not sure, was it in F sharp 7, the one that allows the use of underscores. When was that? F sharp six? No, F sharp five. Underscores. Uh, let me find this. Should be a RFC. Huh. Not, not seeing it. Uh, okay, well, then an even simpler one would be this RFC. Uh, the, this one allows you to uh, to write these things here, whereas it wasn't allowed before. You had to put in the dots or an, uh, uh, un, uh, underscores here. I, th I think that should have a dot there. And you can take a look at the implementation for this. And it's a much smaller change. Dotless float 32 literals. And you can see some changes to the regular expressions up here. And a change in the lexer to how we process uh, IEEE 32. And then you can see that if we're supporting this particular language feature, and and it contains this then we uh then we do some processing like that okay what's the difference here uh okay i what's the actual change here oh yes this can be an integer at this point that's the that's the change that that line here has been changed to be that line there. So an integer can follow before the F here. OK, so that's a, that's a study a study guide uh, for anyone who wants to study that a little bit further. Follow through FS1080. Uh, right. Uh, did I miss anything? Any questions, anyone? Any parts of parsing and checking, uh, sorry, parsing and lexing that I've forgotten? Speak now, or we have to, have, or we'll do a whole new session on it. I, I warn you, we'll do a whole new session on parsing and lexing. <laughs> if anyone's got questions, it's the last time I'm ever going to answer questions on it. <laughs> it's not true. That's not true. Anyone? Yeah, I think, I mean, like, at least per personally for me, it's, you know, it makes sense and we'll answer a lot of questions in the chat. Um, okay. I guess we can, um, we can have, like, if people will, will, you know, like, maybe watch the, watch the video and have more questions, they can uh, ask them in the YouTube comments or on the GitHub. And so, yeah, I guess, so, I guess. So. Yeah. Sounds great. Um, OK, uh, then I guess we can call it call it quits. Thanks everyone for coming. And I think that was a tough topic to go through because it's a lot of technical stuff and that old a lot of old code and the like. But you know, it's important to get it on the record. We've got the videos up there for future reference and we'll look forward to getting on to 
the next week's topic. We're taking suggestions for next, well, next, probably in two weeks' time, for the uh, next topic we'll be covering. And so please uh, uh, chat with Vlad or make suggestions on the Slack channel or in the comments here or on the GitHub issues. And we can uh, talk about what topic will come next. And thank you very much for coming, everyone. We've had a good, good audience here today and look forward to having you back next time.